In the next few minutes, I'll talk about manifestations of staph infections with the focus on staph aureus clinical manifestations. Again, we're here in the upper left corner in the gram-positive cocci realm of the universe. And I want to review the major clinical manifestations of Staph aureus infections. And to really hammer home this point, you need to recognize that Staph aureus is a leading cause of multiple types of infections, including some with high mortality rates. Whatever branch of medicine you go into, you will encounter this pathogen repeatedly in your career. Before I discuss some of the inflammatory Staph aureus-mediated diseases, I want to take a moment to speak about Staph aureus toxin-mediated diseases contrast these in your mind with infections that are due to direct tissue invasion, which is what I'll speak about on the following slides. But it's worth knowing that there are several diseases uh, that are associated with toxins secreted by Staph aureus. Um, the most serious of these is toxic shock syndrome, uh, in which a toxin called toxic shock syndrome, toxin 1, uh, acts as a superantigen that results in polyclonal T-cell activation uh, this leads to a syndrome with fever, hypotension, and rash, which may be fatal. This was initially associated with superabsorbent tampons, and that may appear as a uh, board question for you, although that association is less common uh, in the present day. Another syndrome is Staph aureus food poisoning related to a preformed heat-stable uh, enterotoxin secreted by Staph aureus. Notable features of this uh, clinical syndrome are a short incubation period of less than six hours and a vomiting predominant illness. The fact that this uh, toxin is heat stable means that cooking food that contains it will not alleviate the disease or prevent the disease. A third syndrome is staph scalded skin syndrome, which is caused by exfoliative toxin and leads to a desquamating rash. Again, these are related to staph aureus toxins as opposed to diseases related to direct tissue invasion by Staph aureus bacteria. Staph aureus is a leading cause of multiple types of infections. These include skin and soft tissue infections, bacterial infection of the bloodstream or bacteremia, infections of heart valves called endocarditis, of bone and joint infections, and pulmonary infections. And again, this picture shows the classic appearance, gram-positive cocci and clusters on a gram stain. The Staph aureus causes a variety of skin and soft tissue infections. As discussed previously, there was a rise of these infections in the 1990s associated with the community-acquired MRSA clone that led to an increase in primarily skin and soft tissue infections among populations that weren't previously at high risk of these infections. The manifestations of Staph aureus skin and soft tissue infections are diverse, so there are Benign manifestations, or relatively benign at least, such as impetigo pictured here, a staph infection that's restricted to the superficial layers of the skin, or in the next picture, an uncomplicated skin abscess. So a patient who might be systemically well, but have this one area of painful staph infection, in this case on the leg. In contrast, staph is also associated with severe skin and soft tissue infections. These include necrotizing fasciitis, and pyomyositis, or pus in the muscle. And Staph aureus is the most common pathogen in surgical site infections and in cutaneous abscesses. Remember that Staph aureus is present on the skin and on mucosal surfaces such as the anterior nares. Once you realize that, you'll understand that anything that causes a break in those barriers can lead to Staph aureus getting access to the bloodstream and causing bacteremia. So common sources are vascular catheters uh, or skin infections or pulmonary infections. The most important distinction once you have a patient who has Staph aureus in the bloodstream is to figure out whether this is complicated or uncomplicated infection. I'll outline that on the next slide, the definition of those, uh, of those two terms. But for patients who have complicated infections, which is primarily staph that has landed elsewhere, either on hardware or has set up deep tissue abscesses or other complications, these patients have a worse prognosis and need to be managed in different fashion, for example, with longer durations of, an of antibiotic therapy. And complicated staph aureus bacteremia, it's important to recognize, is associated with poor outcomes, including death, in a fairly remarkable 
uh, 20% or one out of five patients within 30 days of a diagnosis of Staph aureus bacteremia. Additionally, patients who have complicated Staph aureus bacteremia, even if they appear to do well with the initial therapy, are at risk for subsequent recurrence. So as you look at a patient who has Staph aureus bacteremia, what you'll need to ask yourself is whether this patient has uncomplicated or complicated infection. And it's a relative minority of patients who meet the criteria outlined here for uncomplicated infection. These are patients who are more likely to do well. And to be thought of in that group or to be included in that group, these should be patients who don't have endocarditis. They don't have an infection of the heart valve as determined by clinical criteria and by echocardiography or ultrasound of the heart. Uh, these patients should not have an implanted prosthesis, such as orthopedic hardware. Patients who have staph bacteremia and implanted prostheses tend to have complicated infections and do less well. Once you start appropriate therapy, you'll want to draw follow-up blood cultures to see if the patient has cleared their bacteremia or if the bacteria can still be isolated despite therapy. In patients who have follow-up blood cultures that remain positive two to four days after the initial set, and that's a marker of worse prognosis and would merit more aggressive therapy. In contrast, patients whose follow-up cultures are negative two to four days after the initial set, that's a positive sign that that patient may have uncomplicated bacteremia. The patient should also get well, so they should defervesce and be clinically well within the first 72 hours after you've initiated effective antibiotic therapy. And this is a bit self-evident, but there should be no evidence of metastatic sites of infection. So that's a marker of complicated disease or complicated staph aureus bacteremia if a patient has a uh, septic knee, for example, or vertebral osteomyelitis or a site of infection that's set up somewhere uh, besides just in the bloodstream. Now, for all patients who don't meet those fairly stringent criteria, they should be considered to have complicated Staph aureus bacteremia. I'll return in a later talk to what that means for therapy. You have a separate talk on infective endocarditis, so I'll just make a couple comments as it relates specifically to Staph aureus. Worldwide, the proportion of endocarditis cases that's due to Staph aureus is increasing, and in fact, it's the most common cause of endocarditis in the industrialized world. So in the parts of the world where lots of patients are getting invasive procedures or prostheses or organ transplants, uh, Staph aureus incidence is higher and incidence of endocarditis is higher. You could contrast this with uh, more resource-poor regions. I spend a fair bit of time clinically in Kenya where rheumatic heart disease is the most common predisposing factor for endocarditis, and those patients are more likely to be infected with Viridans group streptococci as opposed to Staph aureus. So the clinical epidemiology is different, but overall, the proportion of endocarditis due to Staph aureus appears to be increasing. And Staph aureus endocarditis is different than other organisms that cause endocarditis. So for patients who have Staph endocarditis, it's more likely to be associated with intravenous drug use, with patients who have healthcare contact, with patients who have underlying diabetes mellitus, who have intravascular devices, as we've discussed previously. And once it develops, it's more likely to present acutely in keeping with the virulence of this pathogen to be associated with persistent bacteremia. So these are patients who continue to have positive blood cultures day after day and sometimes even week after week despite appropriate therapy. And it's more likely to lead to complications such as strokes. So a bit of the infection on a heart valve may break off and travel through the circulation and land in the brain causing strokes. Mortality with Staph aureus endocarditis is higher than for other pathogens that tend to cause endocarditis. Moving to the bone and joint infections, it's the leading pathogen, number one, for all three major classes of bone and joint infections. So those are osteomyelitis, especially infections of long bones such as the femur in children, vertebral infection in adults who have bacteremia, so the vertebral body may, bodies may be a landing spot for infection in patients who have bacteremia. And then in patients who have diabetes and have chronic foot ulcers, Staph aureus is a common invasive pathogen which may lead to bone infections uh, in association with those ulcers. It also is the leading pathogen in native joint septic arthritis. This is usually in patients who have bacteremia as well, so the uh, joint uh, becomes the landing spot uh, for an infection with Staph aureus, although it could be as a result of direct trauma and direct invasion into a joint as well. That would be less common. And then for patients who have prosthetic joints, especially in the first month after the 
the hardware is implanted, Staph aureus is the leading pathogen. So if you see a patient who had a hip replacement done a couple of weeks ago and returns with purulent drainage from the incision and has an infection extending down to that hardware, that is most likely to be Staph aureus. Staph aureus also causes a number of different pulmonary infections. So for patients who are on the ventilator, keep in mind that Staph aureus is present in the anterior nares and the oral mucosa. So for patients who have a plastic tube going in their mouth and down into their lungs, that can serve as a conduit for Staph aureus to find its way down into the lungs. So here at Duke and in many institutions, Staph aureus is the leading pathogen implicated in ventilator-associated pneumonias. A picture of an x-ray of a patient in this situation is here on the slide. The original descriptions of Staph aureus infections were actually in post-viral pneumonias around the, the early 1900s. So patients may get a viral infection, such as influenza or uh, another virus, and then they get some damage to the uh, epithelial lining of the lungs. That becomes a scenario where staph can move in. So these patients will start to get better, and then will have a sudden turn for the worse. They've developed a secondary bacterial pneumonia, and Staph aureus is a common pathogen in that scenario as well. A third Staph aureus pulmonary syndrome is this community-acquired MRSA necrotizing pneumonia that was mentioned previously. These cases first started cropping up in the early 1990s and were primarily among young, otherwise healthy patients and were associated with a distressingly high mortality rate. A CT scan a picture is shown here of a patient who has a diffuse bilateral uh, patchy infiltrate pattern uh, as well as some effusions that uh, were associated with community-acquired mesillin-resistant Staph aureus infection. Lastly, staph, can, staph aureus can cause empyema, or infected fluid outside the lung in the chest cavity between the visceral and the parietal pleura. It's the number one pathogen implicated in those presentations as well.